I'm Atuba Judge, and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. I just love the word of God. And, and I love the Lord for giving me this opportunity to share his truth with you. Okay? And before we go into today's broadcast, can we make demand for our daily bread? Are you ready? Say, Father, I demand right now for my daily bread. It's coming to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, we are talking about the spirit of boldness. We, uh, uh, this week, we're just focusing on why you need to exercise boldness. Why you need it. It's important. You do. You need it. See, just like, you know, I was sharing with you yesterday, you remember Paul one time. Now, Peter, Peter is like the, in, in, the truth is Peter is supposed to be the head of the church. So why do you say that? Yeah, because Jesus left the church in his hands. How can you say that? Oh yeah, Jesus left the church in his hands. He, he said to Peter, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now I know there are some arguments, you know, how can you say, he built the church on Peter. You see, what you don't understand is what he meant by I will build my church. In your mind, you're thinking of setting stones and foundation and putting it on the head of Peter. No, that's not what he meant. What he meant is, Peter, you're going to be the focal point of the church. Okay? Just like Jesus was the focal point. Now, I'm leaving, so Peter, you're going to be the rallying point. Now, how do you know that? On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came, it was Peter that spoke up. The word of God was given to him. Now, the same way in that gathering, please understand this. The same way in that gathering, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And now I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, hold on. There was a reason Jesus made that statement, okay? Why did he make that statement? Before he even asked them, who do you say that I am? He didn't, it was not just a, a flippant question. It was, he, he was looking for something, okay? Yes, he was looking for something. And this is areas where the Holy Spirit gives you revelation. Yes, because it's not written in the Bible. So the Holy Spirit gives you revelation. He said, the reason Jesus asked that question is because this is what he was looking for. Now, John said, even as the Holy Spirit has taught you and he is true, you abide in what he has taught you. Now, so Jesus was looking for something. So, and what was he looking for? He knew his time was almost winding up. And just like any organization, there must be a focus man. Yes. You don't just set up an organization and say, this is XYZ organization. Okay, somebody walks in there. Who is he going to meet? No, everybody's equal in this place. So everybody's equal in this place. Everybody's a boss in this place. You know, you know you're setting up a, a monster organization. Right? Got, there must be a focus. There must be a focal point. There must be one that rallies everybody. Okay? So, Jesus knew what was going. And now he was searching. Who do I trust to be the rallying point of this ministry? And so, how is he going to know? He will not choose the person. The Father will choose the person. So, how is he going to know who the Father have chosen? So, he knew that the one the Father will reveal this truth to would be the one. So he threw that question to them. Who do you say that I am? And when Peter spoke, that's why he clearly said it. My father himself revealed this thing to you. That means you are the one he has chosen. You see, it's the same thing Elijah and Elisha. Elijah said to Elisha, remember he asked him, what do you want? And then he said, let the double portion of your spirit rest upon me. And Elijah said to him, you've asked the hard thing. Why did Elijah say you've asked the hard thing? Because he's not the one who can give him that kind of thing. 
I can't have um, one million naira. Okay? And then I ask her, what do you want from me? Say, I want the double of the money you have. So you're actually saying I should give you two million naira. But I don't have two million. I only have one million naira. So I can say, you've asked a hard thing. <laughs> Where am I going to get it from? Okay? But then Elijah said to Elisha, Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken away, it shall be yours. He didn't say, I will give it to you. Mm -mm. He said, it shall be yours. Why did he make that statement? Now, Elijah, I believe, made that statement by the Spirit of God. Okay? So, Elijah followed and he kept following and kept following until he saw Elijah taken up by a chariot. Now, there were other prophets called the sons of the prophet who were far off. And they saw Elijah go up. They saw him go by a wild wind. They saw him go. How do you know they saw him go? Read the Bible. They met Elisha and said, look, let's send men to go search for him in the mountain because we saw him go. It's just like today you throw something up, like, the, like that thing that you've thrown up goes over the mountains. <laughs> Even if it's a plain land, you feel it goes and it ended somewhere. Now, because that's how the shape of the earth is, okay? So, it, like as though it dropped somewhere. So, more like saying, have you ever, uh, <laughs> have you ever tried to, reach a mountain before that you thought was close by and then i realized that ah this thing you're seeing here you have to take a car and drive 30 minutes to get to it but looking at it if you're ah, just across now it's just there yeah so so they said let's true so they saw him go in their minds since that wild wind took him maybe the wild wind would drop him somewhere but there was something elisha saw that they all did not see. And what is that? The chariots that came to pick Elijah. To Elisha, Elijah was relaxed in a vehicle going up to heaven. The other sons of the prophet, they saw a man being carried by the wind. They did not see the vehicle by which he was traveling. Now, so when Elijah said to him, if you see me, when I'm being taken away, it shall be yours. That's what he meant. He didn't mean if you see me go up. He mean if you see the means. Because for you to see the means, it means God himself must open your eyes to see it. Are you following me? So if God opens your eyes to see it, it means he has chosen you. It's the same situation Jesus was in. So if God will open the eyes of anyone to see me or who I am, then that person is qualified to lead the others. So when Peter spoke, like, whoa, so it's Peter. <laughs> Praise God. And that's why he told him, upon this, church, upon this rock, I will build my church. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter rose up and spoke. Not because they all said, Peter, you know, God said, Jesus said upon you, he'll be, oh yeah, speak. No, by the Spirit of God, Peter took charge. When the church was threatening, Threaten, sorry. Peter stood up and he prayed like we read in Acts chapter 4. You remember also when God wanted to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He first sent Peter. Went to Cornelius. So Peter was the one in charge. Why? Because he had the ability to hear from God. And God gave him that open revelation. Who, or who Jesus is not. That's how you guide people. You guide people by that understanding of the personality of Jesus. And, and, and the truth is, the more Jesus reveals himself to you, the more you see him, the more you guide people more. The more you see him, the more you guide people more. Now that's why I was telling yesterday, like it, it was wrong for anybody to say that the revelation is closed. Because the Bible has been written. Very wrong to say that. Because the God who we are talking about is very much alive. 
He is not dead. We're not dealing with a dead chapter or a dead God that we all now have to line up with the things that have been written about him. He is bigger than everything that have been written about him. And number two, all prophecies in scriptures, please note this, all prophecies in scriptures, the understanding of it can never be given by men. Gather professors, gather Hebrew scholars, they will not accurately give you. That's why sometimes, you know, a, a Hebrew rabbi wrote a book about the end time. Everybody wants to read the book. Because if he's a Hebrew rabbi, he must understand. Say there, has calcul- there is no calculation to accurately read end time. <laughs> it's got none. The only way we will understand things as they unfold is when the Spirit of God begins to open our eyes, open our understanding to it. Are you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Peter came to visit Paul. And while he came, he was eating freely with the Gentiles. And then some people from Jerusalem came. James, by this time, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Now, how he became the leader, now James was the brother of Jesus, okay? How he became the church, the leader of the church, we really don't know. The criteria they use, now that's why I tell people like, it doesn't mean the early apostles were perfect. They made blunders. Yes, they did. Just like it's happening today. So, Jesus himself chose Peter. And he didn't just choose Peter because Peter was close to him. If he wanted to choose who was close to him, he would have chosen John. But he chose Peter because God opened the revelation of his person to him. So I be, now I don't even know if Peter himself understood what I'm sharing with you now. Okay? So I don't know how they came about James. It could simply be just like we would do today. Who else? Since Peter and the rest, everybody's traveling out. We need to hold the home front very firmly. So who else? And the brother of Jesus. And he knows Jesus. He knew Jesus by the flesh, not by revelation. Okay? And when you make that kind of a person, the leader. Now, truly speaking, James could have known Jesus by revelation. Yes, just like John and Jesus. Remember, John knew Jesus. Jesus was a cousin of John. But the day John was baptizing men in River Jordan and his cousin showed up. Imagine growing up with this fellow. You know, you visit once in a while. They say, ah, this is Auntie Mary's son. Oh, this is Auntie Elizabeth's son that she had in her old age. Oh, wow. You know, in fact, there are stories that the day time people were born six months apart, this thing happened. They said, whoa, okay, ah, cousin, cousin, how now? How now? Fine, oh, fine, fine. And, and, and Jesus started his walk. And like, oh, okay. And he said, eh, we're in our family and we love God. And God had told John that, look, you go to Jordan and be baptizing people. One day, you will see one come to you. When you see him come, you will see the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. He's the one. When he comes, announce him. And so John is here baptizing. And then he looks up and he sees somebody walking. And then he sees the Spirit of God, just like God described it to him. And then he goes, whoa, the one whom God told me is here. And as he came closer, he noticed it was his cousin. Do you know that can put some people off? Huh? I think that's one part of the issues John had. <laughs> He's got the eye, I think so. Realizing that this is God, this guy that we grew up together. He's <laughs> got uh, how? And if he's the one God should have told me since. I've known this guy. So why didn't God just tell me? See that your cousin? He's the one. Uh, when he's 30 years old, he will come to be baptized. And then uh, why didn't God do that? Now that can be a place for one's arguments. Are you getting what I'm saying? And because of that, don't believe him. No wonder John, you know, was in trouble. And then he had to send to Jesus. said, go and find out. Is he the one? Is he really, really the one? Because, I mean, 
On cousin level, you're supposed to come and help me. On ministerial level, you're supposed to come and help me. But the problem was, Jesus couldn't help John. Why? Now, I don't think there's any explanation anybody can give you that will make sense. <laughs> the reason Jesus didn't go to help John. I don't think so. I know the reason. But there are things you don't say in the realm of men. No, we'll go. Yeah, but even if, even if, even if you understand. Yeah. But Jesus truly was restricted from doing anything concerning John. But it was his cousin. So you mean he just let his cousin die like that? He didn't let his cousin die. But he was restricted. And when his cousin died, he felt bad about it. So why didn't he go and raise him up? And then he went to raise his friend. His friend. Hiya! Have you, have you thought of being a brother to John? And having Jesus in your family? Have you thought about it? And you hear that he died. Jesus did not even go to prison to visit him. Never for what? In fact, when John sent a message to him, at least he should have decoded that. Oh, let me go and visit this, my brother. And visit, visit first. No, we're not even talking about doing a miracle. Visit him first. He didn't. Then he died. They buried him. And Jesus was angry. But he didn't go. Then one friend from another village dies for this dead. And you go there and we hear, you called him out of the grave and he came back. Ah. Now you see why in their hometown they didn't believe Jesus. Are you getting the gist now? Because if you really can raise the dead, your own cousin that was a preacher, man who stood for the gospel, died here here we know he died they buried him he did nothing and then you now go you're bringing gist for us i beg please leave all those foreign gists you know just like people ask today if god is doing all this miracle why don't we go to our street and, and heal all the beggars you, you heard people talk like that foolish talk very foolish talk because even if jesus was physically here today he won't go to the street and healing beggars didn't you read that he went to the pool of Bethsaida? In that pool, they have a very great company of sick people. They gather around that pool. Jesus went there quietly and healed only one man. Do you want to get well? Uh, okay, take up your bed and go home. And Jesus woke him. The man didn't know it was Jesus. Now, now, if everyone had known that he was Jesus, trust me, Jesus wouldn't have left that place that day. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But they didn't know he was Jesus. Whether he disguised himself or he was not that popular yet, probably. Because <laughs> there, there are times, one's name can be popular, but people don't know his face. Remember, those days there were no cameras, there were no TVs, there were no, no way, you just know a name, the name. His fame will spread abroad. Man, there's one Jesus that's doing great miracles. Now, the only way you know him is if he comes to your area and then he says, I am that Jesus. Ah! And also remember the name he was bearing there and other people were bearing the same name. So it's not, not a special name. Jesus, everybody, oh, Jesus, no. So remember, that's why they call him Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? The same way we name people in, in, even in our country, especially in the north, they, they name people by their, their village. Yeah, they do. They name people by their village. So, and, and I hear most times is when they travel. Okay. So, for example, in the north, find a lot of people in Kano. They are really not from Kano. And then you hear a lot of names like um, um, Musa Dan Ladi. Okay. Now, that Musa Dan Ladi, you ask, uh, who's Dan Ladi in your place? No, there's no Dan Ladi. Oh, Dan Ladi is the name of my village. Oh, ah. So, what's going on? Now, where they meet and they are doing business, there are several Musas. Okay, so what's your name? Musa, what's your name? Musa. Okay, mm. you, you came from Dan Ladi. Yes, okay, so you're Musa Dan Ladi. You, you are Musa Shinkafa. You, you understand what I'm saying? So, that's how they distribute names. And then it sticks. It becomes their names. So, that's how Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, are you getting it now? Not because... Um, it, it, because there were other people answering the name Jesus. 
whatever it was called then. I'm sharing all this with you to let you see that God is beyond what any man thinks. And God can be right beside you doing wonders and you don't know it. My prayer, because for you to exercise boldness, you must see what God is doing in your day and in your time. I pray the Spirit of God will open your eyes to see his work. And I pray that your eyes are not limited by what men have said or what men have taught or what even the Bible have taught you. But that your eyes will be open to see the Spirit of God teach you. Let the Holy Ghost be your teacher and you will experience great blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.